Welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to tackle the weighty subject of overweight and obesity. I'm going to start out by giving you kind of an update of the state of affairs. At Texas Children's, we have started a bariatric surgery program for adolescents, given the, the rising girth of our nation. We had a young lady who was coming in, and she had a, a BMI, which we'll talk about in a little bit, a BMI of close to 50. And the question that we toyed with is, you know, how are we going to teach her about her diet? So we talked about her pre-op diet and her post-op diet. And unfortunately, the message that she got was bariatric surgery was a quick fix, and she wasn't going to have to work on her eating habits. So her first question after surgery is, when can I have Doritos? So I think the challenge that we have as we explore this topic is how are we going to get ourselves more centered and in our approach to overweight and obesity? We've got to start out with a few definitions. What is overweight? Overweight defined as BMI standards, which we'll get to. Overweight is a, a weight of between 25 and 29.9 by BMI standards. Obesity is any weight BMI of greater than 30. So my little girl with her high BMI was clearly obese. We also have to use the word over fat, and I know that's a sensitive subject, but we have to talk about people who are over fat. These are people who may have a normal BMI, but are carrying more of their weight as body fat, and so that definition is over fat. What we know is obesity is now a global problem, and it contributes to ill health, displacing undernutrition or malnutrition, and infectious disease as a, the number one global nutrition-related problem. It is on the rise in every country in the world, in Southeast Asia, North Africa, and the Middle East, and most, mostly in the industrialized areas. But in the United States, the prevalence has increased over the last decades to, from about 25% to 66% of Americans fall into that category of overweight or obese. Unfortunately, children and adolescents are the group that's getting the biggest, the fastest. Clearly, one in six children and, and, and adolescents are overweight, and a similar number are at risk of being overweight. And I like to think about it this way. If obesity was an infectious disease, if this was SARS or this was HIV and we were looking at these gloom and doom statistics, we would, as a country, marshal all of our resources in fighting this disease and clearly we're not there yet. Well, the dichotomy here is that obesity rates increase. We have an increased societal emphasis on thinness and weight management as well. Each year in this country, the diet industry makes between 40 and 50 billion dollars from weight loss products. In the year 2000, a full 38 percent of adults were trying to lose weight. Now, unfortunately for most of us, insurance reimbursement for services is poor, and so most folks are going to look for alternative ways of, of getting their weight under control. Now, does dieting work? Well, clearly it does. A recent study published in the New England Journal of Medicine suggests that any dietary strategy is going to work, but here's the caveat. You have to stick with it. And unfortunately, the average diet in the United States, when dieters have been surveyed, lasts two weeks. Well, two weeks, if I have 100 pounds to lose, probably isn't going to get me what I'm looking for. Also, there is more fraud and misinformation in this industry than any other. So we've got this, we're getting heavier, we're spending more money, but we're not getting the results. We know that children and adolescents are concerned with weight. And in a study involving grade school girls, now pay attention to this statistic, 28 to 40 percent reported being on a diet are concerned about being fat. So clearly we have this emphasis on weight. It's unpopular to be overweight and we've got people dieting but we're not getting the results. Well part of it I believe is also uh, misinformation about the strategies to lose weight. The YRBS data and that stands for Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Data suggests that teens believe the best strategy to lose weight is to exercise and skip meals. Diet and calorie management doesn't rank as high, and so when you actually look at effective strategies, you have to have some caloric restriction, but surveys suggest that teens don't believe that. So strategies, how do we get youth to understand this a little bit better? Well, there have been some suggestions that we need to post calories in schools and certainly in college dorms. So if we have the meal for the day, if we post the calories, will that be a good solution? 
And the answer is no, it's not really a good solution. And Harvard recently removed this information for fear of contributing to eating disorders because students were going in and selecting their foods based on the calories and not necessarily the nutritional value. Well, now we've got to look at factors in the development of obesity. How did we get here? Well, obviously there are biological factors. And as with every other chronic illness, genetics can rule the day. When both parents are morbidly obese, there's an 80% chance that children will be obese. That's kind of a scary statistic. The good news is when neither parent is obese, there's less than a 10% chance that they're gonna be obese. But we've got, again, this middle group, about 25 to 30% of obese people have normal weight parents. So where is the, the role of genetics? Well, some great twin studies suggests that there is a genetic component. It's estimated that your genetic makeup can account for about 50 up to 90% of the variations that you might have in terms of your ability to store body fat. So a way of looking at it th is this. Genetics can load the gun. You can be behind the eight ball with this, but the environment pulls the trigger. So you might have the genetic predisposition, but again, it's the environmental factors that may have uh, the advantage of expressing those genes. Now what about fat cells? Can we grow fat cells? What, how, what role do fat cells play in the development of obesity? And clearly we have three different types of obesity that have been defined. We have hypercellular, too many cells, hypertrophic, big cells, and hyperplastic, many more cells. So hypercellular obesity is an above average number of fat cells. You can be born with them, i.e. genetics, or you can develop them through overeating. Some older studies suggested that the number of fat cells that we had were fixed and they just became bigger. And clearly newer research is suggesting there's something else going on. You can also have hypertrophic obesity. These are fat cells that are larger than normal. These cells continue to expand as they fill with fat. And when they are full, the body now has the ability to make new fat cells. Here's the scary part. Once body fat is three to five times the normal amount, generally have larger fat cells and you can make more of them. Hyperplasia, making more cells. Weight loss doesn't decline the number of fat cells, making it difficult to lose weight once the body has created these fat cells. Well, why is that the case? When the fat cell becomes empty, biological triggers are signaled saying, you know what, I'm not happy with this, eat more food, fill me back up so I feel biologically normal. Now certainly sex and age are going to play a role in the development of obesity. And part of that is because men and women, males and females, set different weight standards for themselves. Growth and development occurs at different rates and has a different outcome for boys versus girls. So I always say if I could rule the, the world, I would teach puberty a little bit differently to, to adolescence than is being taught now. Boys grow up and out under the influence of testosterone and add significant amounts of lean mass during puberty. Girls grow up and then they fill out and they're adding some body fat under the influence of estrogen. That is a normal phenomena. That should occur. That's the way it should be. But girls look at this as undesirable. They see their older brothers getting bigger and more muscular, and they look and say, okay, now I've got fat on the inside of my, of my thighs, I've got a little fat on my tummy, and that is absolutely normal. That is not pathology. Certainly in childhood, boys are less likely to think they're overweight, and males in general are more accepting of personal weight gain. Well, that would make sense. If I'm gaining weight and I'm gonna add a significant amount of lean mass, no wonder you'd be more accepting of personal weight gain. In early adulthood, the same number of men want to lose weight versus gain weight, where almost all women in early adulthood are looking to lose weight. Adult males tend to see themselves um, as overweight at higher weights, where women think they're overweight when they're closer, closer to that healthy, ideal body weight. In fact, some studies suggest adult women only feel thin when they're about 10% below their ideal body weight. So we have this, this uh, unbelievable difference in the way men and women view weight. 
both men and women gain most of their weight between the ages of 25 and 34. And for women, that weight gain can continue to go through menopause. There's been one study that suggested that most women from the ages of about 25 to 40 gain 20 pounds. And so it's this insidious weight creep that gets most of us. Certainly there's a role of race and ethnicity in weight gain. We know American Indians, African Americans, and Hispanic women are more likely to be overweight than white women, but again, that's the rates are going to be similar for men. Black, Hispanic, Native Americans, and Pacific Islanders typically value thinness less than white Americans. So I'm going to put it in a different context. I'm going to suggest that other ethnic groups, other than Caucasians, tend to have a more normalized view of what weight should be, not this, this um, distorted view of, of I need to be less than 100% than, uh, of my ideal body weight. Well, we now know that there's an actual science of satiety. And remember, satiety is that feeling of fullness. And this is under the control of two relatively newly discovered hormones, leptin and ghrelin. Leptin signals that the body has had enough food. So it's kind of the off switch in terms of satiety. Leptin resistance, however, can occur like, occur like insulin resistance in diabetes. So what does that mean? What that means is that you're producing leptin, your body's not using it effectively, and you don't get that off switch. You might have read some studies in the newspaper suggesting that sleep deprivation may contribute to obesity. Well, leptin actually decreases with sleep deprivation. So that old adage of get eight to 10 hours of sleep per night really may be an effective weight loss strategy. Well, in the human body, we always have opposing hormones. And in this case, ghrelin is the hormone that stimulates appetite. It's the on switch. So I think in the, the years to come, we're going to see some pharmacology directed at manipulating those hormones, and that's a few years off. Certainly, social and environmental factors can play a role in the development of obesity. Americans are more likely to be obese if they have a low socioeconomic status. Well, why is that the case? Oftentimes, if you, if you spend time, and I do, I, I'm very privileged to work in an inner city high school in Houston, and you see higher rates of obesity, but the reasons are many. If you go around the high school that I'm at, there are no grocery stores. People would have to take a bus to go to the grocery store. And so it's grocery stores, it's the safety of neighborhoods, it's the quality of food that they can get. And so certainly when I leave the high school, where most of my teens are getting their food from is the convenience store down the street. Well, we've all shopped at convenience stores, and that's what they are. They are convenient. They're not designed to give you all the rich produce that you can get in bigger grocery store chains. Poverty also. Certainly many individuals uh, under the federal poverty line have very few resources in terms of putting together or constructing a healthier diet. And quite honestly, fat and sugar calories, unbelievably cheap. But we also see obesity rates rising among the affluent as well. The challenge we have, however, is we have a social stigma against individuals who are overweight. Employers, for example, want to hire people closer to ideal body weight. Now, is this, is this bias or is it practicality? Well, if you're an operating room nurse and you weigh 400 pounds, you might not be able to navigate around the OR table. And so now there's a space constraint there and what are we going to do? So I think there's this little, okay, yes, employers want to hire individuals closer to ideal body weight aesthetically. And then there's the practical side. Are, are some of our overweight clients and, and patients and employees going to be able to navigate around? Level of education is associated with body weight as well, but mostly only for women, illustrating the different standards for men versus women. And then the media. Oh my goodness, the media. We see and are um, bombarded with images of individuals who are lean and fit in a country that's getting heavier. So again, we've got this, this wide divergence between individuals who are overweight and then are exposed to these media influences of ideal body weight. Certainly in the last Olympics, when some of the women competing in the Olympics were heavier, disparaging remarks were being made about their body weight, but you didn't hear it about the men in the Olympics. We can talk about the modeling industry, we can talk about beauty pageants, and we see oftentimes these weights creeping down in an overweight society. 
There have been some estimates that suggest that to be a Miss America, your percent ideal body weight needs to be 10 to 15 percent below ideal. So, oh my, we've got now all these biological factors, we've got environmental and social factors that are really um, complicating this. But one that doesn't get explored very often is something called the built environment. And that influences our behaviors. So, for example, if you live in a neighborhood with no sidewalks, are you going to go out and walk? Well, in my neighborhood, I can walk to the end of my road and then I'm right out on a busy street with very narrow sidewalks. I don't feel safe. So I actually have to get in my car to go get physical activity. Well, think about inner city neighborhoods. If you don't have walkability, if you don't have good sidewalks, people are not going to be out and being physically active. Certainly, we have social factors as well in the way that we choose our food. We choose energy-dense foods, a lot of calories in a small space. And when we're with friends, we tend to overeat. Now, think about times that you've gone and spent time with relatives and there's food everywhere, and someone says, don't you want an extra serving? Oh, we, you know, honey, you lost weight in college. Let me fatten you up a little bit. So again, we've got these, these pressures to eat that oftentimes, again, contribute to some of the social factors. Science also suggests we eat what's in front of us. And so if the portions that you're given are large, if the portions are large, you tend to eat, again, what's on your plate. Lifestyle and behavior factors as well. Physical activity comes up over and over and over again. But a lack of exercise is a major factor contributing to obesity. Only 22% of Americans get the recommended amount of exercise. And remember, that's generally somewhere in the range of 30 minutes a day most days of the week. Here's something frightening. 25% of U.S. adults are not active at all. Really, all they do is go from their chair to the car, really not getting any kind of purposeful exercise. Television viewing is highly correlated with a low level activity for both children and adults. For every two hours of television that you watch, you can just watch the rates of obesity rise. Why is that the case? Most of us are not terribly active while we're watching television. Here's a tip for you. Get an exercise bike, put it in front of the television, and make sure that you're riding that bike for at least 30 minutes of your television viewing a day. Psychological factors. People ever eat for other reasons besides hunger? Certainly. People eat to cope with stress, alleviate boredom, and we have this category of restrained eaters that are really trying hard to control their weight, but they'll reduce their calorie intake by fasting or avoiding foods, then overeat when stress triggers the uh, release of that inhibition. This can occur again when normal weight women perceive themselves as fat and are really trying to force their weight lower than biologically intended. Keep in mind, habits can be passed down from mother to daughter. And yes, I'm saying mother to daughter because it's more women who have restrained eating than men. Think about this. If you come to the dinner table and you criticize the way you look or say, boy, I have gained weight, your daughter or granddaughter sitting there listening to you now thinks this is what women do. Women have self-deprecating talk. They criticize the way they look. This is what normal women do. Now, people with healthier lifestyles, people who communicate, manage conflict, manage problems better, often tend to, tend to manage their weight better as well. OK, now we got to get down to the nuts and bolts. How do we know if we're overweight? Well, BMI is the the gold standard of population-based measurements of overweight. So if you're reading a study or you read something in the newspaper, nine times out of ten, they are going to give you the BMI of that population. Now, there are web-based ways of calculating your BMI. So if you're internet savvy, cdc.gov would be a great place to go and find a BMI calculator. If you like to crunch numbers a little bit, you can take your weight in pounds times 703, and divide it by inches squared, your height in inches squared. In general, a BMI of less than 24.9 is considered normal weight, so give yourself a pat on the back. If you're between 25 and 29.9, you're considered overweight. And a BMI of greater than 30 is considered obese. Now remember, BMI is a population-based standard. It's not necessarily the best assessment tool for an individual. So, for example, 
athletes have a high BMI, and again, in my world of professional football players, we encourage a high BMI, but we're encouraging it because we want more muscle mass. And remember, muscle weighs something. So individuals who have an elevated muscle mass, their weight's higher on the scale, but their percent body fat can be lower. So I think the challenge is BMI is not necessarily the best individual tool. And again, if you're very physically active, you might want another assessment technique. Certainly within that, that category of BMI, what it doesn't account for is individuals who are normal weight. BMI looks great, but they're metabolically obese. Remember that woman who was five foot six and 118 pounds that we discussed? She was 40% body fat. She was normal weight, but meta metabolically has all the risk factors for someone who's overweight. Certainly um, for most of us, BMI is gonna be great and BMI can predict chronic risk of the big three, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, because they all increase with increasing BMI. The definitive assessment for body composition, if you are one of those outliers, is what is my percent body fat? My percent body fat can tell where in this range I am. So say, for example, I have a normal BMI, but I want to see what that body composition is. How much of my weight is muscle versus fat? I can go get a percent body fat done. And if a woman has a percent body fat of greater than 30%, or for a man, greater than 20%, Lo and behold, that can be a predictor, okay? So where do you get this done? There are two different types of tests that you can get. One is called a bod pod, and we'll have more about this in your guidebook. And the other is underwater weighing. Those are two things that you really have to go to an exercise facility to get done. So what about the health risks of overweight and obesity? Well, one of the things we have to understand is the longer the obesity persists, the higher the risks. It is now presumed that the rising rates of obesity will reverse the actual increases in life expectancy that we've seen in this country. One of the great physicians I work with, Dr. Bill Klish, really brought this home to me when he said, children that are born in the year 2000, this will be the first generation of children that don't outlive their parents. And what's going to change life expectancy is going to be obesity. The cost of obesity-related diseases are costing the American taxpayers billions of dollars. So what do we know? Overweight people are two to six times more likely to develop hypertension. They're more likely to have increased risk for stroke, deep vein thrombosis, clots in the legs. Certainly we know excess body fat, keep in mind it's excess body fat, can lead to impaired cardiac function, heart function, from the increased mechanical workload on the heart as well as just the heart not being able to pump as effectively. We know from previous lectures that abnormal amounts of blood fats and lipoproteins are associated with, uh, with obesity, including high blood triglycerides, low HDL, and again, that high LDL-HDL ratio. Excessive body fat can lead to insulin resistance and increase the likelihood of type 2 diabetes in both adults and in children. We're going to cover this in more depth in the lecture on metabolic syndrome. Obesity can be an increased risk factor for the development of cancer because part of the eating patterns that get us to obesity, most people don't become obese by eating fruits and vegetables. Most people become obese by that increased amount of hidden fat and sugars in our diets and certainly those kind of dietary strategies are a risk factor for cancer. Again, here comes activity. Inactivity is also a cancer risk. In fact, some estimates suggest that poor diet and exercise may account for up to a third of the cancer risk. Excess body fat can lead to different types of cancers, most notably endometrial cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, and there's a thought about breast cancer as well. Obese people are more likely to have degenerative joint disease, osteoarthritis, and gout, which is the de deposition of painful uric acid crystals in the joint that make this all difficult to, to ambulate. So in the world of professional football, what contributes to obesity in retired football players is they have osteoarthritis from playing the game, they become obese, they develop gout, and what do you think that does to your ability to ambulate and be physically active? Well, certainly it decreases it. 
That gout is oftentimes linked with insulin resistance, and this insulin resistance the inability to use your insulin effectively comes over and up over and over again in terms of chronic disease risk. Obese people are more likely to have sleep apnea, mechanical breathing constraints, particularly during exercise. It just takes more effort to work the chest wall if the chest wall has increased amounts of fat. Certainly individuals who are overweight have more problems with anesthesia during surgery as well as compromised wound healing. Other risk factors include gallbladder disease. Remember that gallbladder is the storage house of bile. And when, the, when there's a lot of bile production, you can actually get an increased likelihood of uh, gallstones. A new and emerging consequence, however, is fatty infiltration of the liver. It is known as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And some estimates suggest as that liver becomes infiltrated with fat, it causes hepatitis, and that hepatitis can actually lead to liver failure and transplantation. Oftentimes what's underestimated in this overweight and obesity is the psychological burden. Depression, being stigmatized by peers, bullying for children, discrimination, and I call this the last accepted form of discrimination. And we don't really have a great resolution. Certainly, we are sensitive to the fact that we have different religious beliefs and different cultural beliefs. We're different based on our ethnicity. And we don't, we're sensitive to that. But we're not so sensitive to the individuals who are overweight. In terms of a public health initiative, obesity really needs to be the new smoking campaign. We need to get behind obesity like we did with cigarette smoking and hopefully get the same kind of great results. The other costs that we see in 2002, the cost of overweight in this country in obesity was estimated to be $92 billion. When a day of fiscal responsibility and all of us trying to tighten our belts, $92 billion being spent on obesity treatments, um, comorbidities, disease. Well, there is good news. There is some good news. There is a silver lining here. Losing weight can reduce these disease biomarkers. People with, that are obese that lose as little as 5 to 10 percent of their body weight, just small amounts, can have improvement in, in blood pressure, improvement in insulin levels, glucose, cholesterol, and triglycerides. So you don't have to lose 80 pounds to get good results. As little as 5 to 10 percent weight loss can help. The perception of weight. Okay, weight and, and uh, the way that we view weight is oftentimes dictated by, again, what we see. The weight of celebrity models can oftentimes give us what desirable weight is. But keep in mind, keep in mind, we don't have to get to that weight in order to have a desirable outcome, 5 to 10 percent of your body weight. Healthcare professionals really do treat obesity like a disease with multiple contributing factors. So in the healthcare world, we're going to emphasize health and fitness over necessarily what you should weigh on the scale. We're going to emphasize moderation and balanced diet, low fat, high in healthful foods. Behavioral change as a process that requires really a new skill set that must be taught. If I always eat X when I get home from work in the afternoon, I'm going to have to work really hard on changing that behavior if that X food is a high fat, high sugar treat. And certainly we're going to have to promote as a healthcare team substantial increase in moderate activity because keep in mind a good percentage of Americans get no activity at all. Okay, frequently asked questions. What is weight cycling? I get, I hear that all the time. How, what is this weight cycling phenomena? Weight cycling is a pattern of losing and regaining weight over and over and over again. You hear people joke, I've lost the same hundred pounds ten times. What ends up happening is when you weight cycle, when you, and particularly when you lose weight quickly, when you lose weight quickly, you're losing body fat and body muscle. When you regain the weight quickly, you're gaining back mostly body fat. So here's the problem. I'm losing metabolically active tissue when I diet, i.e. lean mass, and I'm regaining back more fat than I had before. So what I'm doing with weight cycling over and over and over again is I'm, I'm dropping that functional lean mass, that wonderful metabolically active tissue, and I'm replacing it with just extra weight. Best example I can give you is Oprah. 
I admire her. She's unbelievably courageous. She um, gives us all of her weight struggles in a very public venue, but you see her struggle over and over and over again with weight cycling. Now, certainly there are uh, individuals out there in this anti-diet movement saying we should have size acceptance. What about these people? Well, I do believe we need size acceptance in this country. We really have to have a different way that we're looking at obesity. I think, however, there's a downside to this size acceptance. And the downside is that oftentimes we're not calling obesity what it is. It is a disease. And if we think about it as a disease, we're going to treat the consequences. And I think in treating the consequences, the comorbidities, we have a better chance of doing that. So from a psychological standpoint, I'm going to tell you I think it's great. However, in terms of a physiological standpoint, I think the challenge is you can still have risks associated with that weight, and we do have to address those. I appreciate everyone's attention through this weighty subject, and thank you very much.